You're listening to the Clear Creek Resources Podcast from Clear Creek Community Church. To hear more, check out clearcreekresources.org. All right, Bruce, you're in the hot seat today. All right. So we're here to, to just get to know you a little bit better, especially for those maybe who see you preach. You know, you've been around for a very long time. I was going to uh, say, man, I have been around yeah. so like yeah. for 28 plus years. Yeah. So, And every time we have a podcast, it's an opportunity for people to talk about, you know, themselves and things like that. But this is all about Bruce. And so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that that makes me sweat, it actually. It does. I know. I know it makes you sweat, but I know that uh, I'm interested in talking to you and a lot of people are interested in hearing it. So uh, we'll start off with some easier questions. All right. Uh, what's your favorite thing about being a pastor? That's an easy one? I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it is a pretty easy one. You know, for me, I think just working with people... Um, is my f- my favorite thing. You know, I, I like to preach. I like to lead. But, I mean, if there's one thing that I guess I just get the greatest joy out of, it's being a part of a team and feel, feeling like everybody can play a role on a team and there's a great satisfaction when, when a team functions well, especially for the kingdom. And how long have you been a pastor for? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I have to add it up in my head. Let's see, nine, uh, 37 years. All right. So in those 37 years, you've preached, I don't even know how many sermons you would even estimate. I mean, a lot of sermons. Yes. Um, and even more services, because oftentimes you're preaching that same sermon, multiple services. What are some funny things that have happened when you are up there preaching? Surely in those, <laughs> in those years, yeah. there's been something. Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, a couple come to mind quickly. Uh, once while I was here... Let me get to tell you too. Uh, here, I, I was preaching one morning, and uh, actually, a guy sitting on the front row, and he was one of my top five. I mean, he was there uh, because I had invited him to come, and he got a a call. And this was before we were in the Egret Bay building, and he took it on the front row, and and he's having this conversation. I'm looking down, thinking, I said, I, I'm kind of. Sorry, I invited you to come. My gosh, it's terrible. Because, you know, everyone around was just looking at him. He's having a conversation out loud and, uh, while I'm preaching in the front row. So uh, that's what you get when you, you really hope to reach people who uh, haven't been a lot, in, you know, in church. Yeah. Uh, another one is um, one of the guys that actually helped uh, start the church. He loved the fact that we could have coffee and stuff in the service. But I guess one day he got thirsty for something else. So while I'm preaching, we were in the intermediate school. While I'm preaching, he stands up, he walks over to the Coke machine, and he's, he's putting the money in the Coke machine. And you can hear the sound, you know, and, and then when he pushes the button, then, you know, big, loud noise, the whole room turns to look at him, but he's not finished. He wants two, right? So he starts putting change in again, takes a second Coke, and uh, goes back to his seat. So I thought, man, this is uh, a lot different than where I came from. Uh, um, but where I did come from <clears throat> was, uh, you know, an older church in the city. And there was a, a lady who was, I'm guessing she was around 80, and, um, and I didn't know her really well, but she always talked back to me. She's African-American, so she kind of came from a culture where you always talk back to the preacher, but she talked back so much it was distracting to me. Um, and so I had a conversation with her, and I said, listen, I so appreciate your support, but I'm a little distracted. And so uh, I think her feelings were hurt. But then the next service, she uh, she didn't talk back. She started snoring. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, she had sleep apnea. And when when she wasn't talking, she was falling asleep. And when I say snoring... I mean, the whole room could hear her snoring, and everyone's looking and laughing, but it's embarrassing. What do you do? Do you wake her up, and then the whole room's looking at her laughing? So anyway, it was, looking back, one of those funny things. Man. All right. So there's funny stuff that happens. I'm also, I'd imagine there's some hard things, and not just in preaching, but what are some of the hardest parts about being a pastor? Um, you know, in, in brief, I would say just staying fresh, uh, it's it's challenging to stay fresh, especially you know in preaching. You only have one life, right? You're telling all these stories out of your life, and sometimes I'm starting a story, and I can just see it in the room. People are like, "Yeah, we've heard that story." Yeah. You know, so. You're going to talk about fishing again. Uh, yeah, there you yeah, go, yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and I think a hard, really hard thing is when um, when there is conflict. It doesn't have to be a major conflict, right? But when there's conflict and 
people that you really love are in the midst of that. And it's no longer just about your relationship and your friendship. It's about the fact that you're, you're a pastor in the church or the pastor of the church. And, uh, and so that just adds a complexity to relationships. Yeah. So have you ever felt that like isolated feeling that like no one really knows me or have you been able to have some relationships and community throughout your time? Uh, I've always had a little bit of that isolated feeling, and yet I think I and we have worked hard uh, to not live isolated lives. But there's always that sense that, yeah, this person doesn't fully know, you know, what uh, what the, the challenges are that I face. But to be fair, I don't know all the challenges that they face either, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so we can't talk ourselves into feeling isolated just because people don't get what our life's like. Yeah, absolutely. So if there's anything else you could do besides being a pastor, what would that be? You know, this, uh, this question was easy for me uh, because I, I think I'd be a coach. I, I just love coaching. It'd any be, particular sport? It'd be a team sport. You yeah. know, it could be any number of sports But because uh, I, I love a lot of sports and, and play a lot of sports, you know, but it, I like team sports. What, what would be the sport that you'd want to coach and what level? Yeah, well, that's. I, I don't know about the level. You know, I have done a lot of coaching. Uh, I've coached basketball. I've coached baseball. You know, uh, some years ago we coached uh, nine-year-old boys baseball, which was horrible. And not because the kids were horrible. It's just a horrible uh, season to coach because it's the first time it's kids pitch, and you're just begging a kid to throw a strike. You know, you, everyone in the stands is just begging a kid to throw a strike because you're just walking kids around the bases, right? So then we went to eight-year-olds, and it was it was heaven. I mean, I loved just coaching technique, you know, for these kids that some of them didn't even know how to throw a ball when they got there, and yet... Uh, did pretty well by the end of the season. Yeah. And well, how'd you guys do? I mean, oh yeah, you've heard the story. Well, yeah, we won the city championship. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I always feel like I'd want to do high school football. Yeah. But I feel like uh, my idea of what a high school football coach is is probably not what I would want to embody now. <laughs> and so I'd be like, I don't know, I don't know how to do it. Like I feel like I'd be. I don't know, saying a lot of stuff that I would regret, I guess, because that's just what high school football coaches did in my day. So, Well, you know, I, I just love the intensity. Mm-hmm. And so I would probably say high school football, too. Yeah. I mean, I think just the yeah the intensity, the camaraderie around that, and you just yes. like see these guys that in a lot of ways they get to be almost like a father figure for, for some of these guys. They're right. looking for someone else to look up to. Whether they have a great father in their home or they don't, they're looking for someone that they can follow and – uh, you have an opportunity to lead and, and love. Yeah, and when I look back, you know, I, I would say sports was as influential as any other area for just leadership development and character development in my life. You know, uh, to to uh, be the kind of person that can do hard things, to do things that hurt, uh, and I, so I, I love it for that. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your family. Well, Susan and I have been married for thirty nine years. Uh, wow. And it's been... And when's your anniversary? When, when are you celebrating 40? Uh, January 8th. So we just have okay. 39. All right. And, uh, and it has been great. And it's, uh, it's amazing to me. I mean, it has passed so quickly. Uh, I have three daughters. They're all grown and um, married with uh, three great sons-in-laws. Um, my oldest is in Puerto Rico, which um, she's been there a little less than two years. And Puerto Rico is a beautiful place, but it's a little more challenging to live there than it is to visit there. So, you know, they're still adjusting. Uh, she has three of my grandsons there. And then uh, two of my daughters and their husbands live in the city uh, of Houston. So uh, one in Montrose, one in the Heights. And uh, so they're not too far away, and we get to see them pretty often. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so tell us about how you met Susan. We met at Howard Payne. She's a year younger than I, uh, actually a little more than that, but school-wise, she's a year younger. And um, we were sitting in the cafeteria. Now, Howard Payne's a small school, so when the next class comes in and, you know, you're a sophomore boy, uh, you're looking around at all the new girls, right? And so I kind of knew who all the girls were, and we had some uh, mutual friends. I'm telling you all this because I'm going to sound really egotistical here in a second. Uh <laughs> Because I'm sitting there at the at the cafeteria, and she's you know just a, across the table and a seat away, and and she leans over, and she tells me that 
she did what she did because she wanted to introduce me to a friend. But she said, I don't believe we've met. You know, my name is Susan England is her maiden name. And uh, so I just looked at her and said, well, it's nice to meet you. I'm Sam Cook." And I just turned, you know, and continued eating. And I could see she was giving me the side eye like, I'm, that's not true. I know that's not true. Uh, but I, I knew who she, I knew that she knew who I was. And it wasn't because I, like I was all that. We just had mutual friends, right? And I'm like, don't give me that. You know, I don't believe we met. Yeah, we. Uh, so anyway, that's how we met. And uh, probably within two days, I'd ask her out. And she told me no multiple times because she had this friend that she was, you know, that had some interest in me. And so she was like, I can't go out with you. My friend's interested. I said, I don't care. I don't care who you're dating. And I don't care if your friend's interested. I want to take you out. And uh, I persisted. And so the rest is history. That's awesome. How old are you whenever, whenever you got married? I was 22 and she was 20. Yeah. We were young. Yeah. Yeah. I was 22 when, when I was married also. Oh, is that right? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, young. Uh, what's your favorite part about being a, a grandparent? You know, I think it's the time that I have the kids away from their parents mm. is my favorite time because it, it's so funny. You know, Ryan, as a you know, parent of the kids, you're, the ages of your kids, you know this, but your kids, they're just, they act differently when you're there. And there, it's just a dynamic where, you know, kids see their world always connected to their parent. And so when their parent's not there, that everything's just changed for them, right? So the, the, the whole authority structure in their life just shifted. And uh, so I love it when we have the kids without their parents there. And they're always, you know, better uh, for us. I mean, they're, they're behaved, but they're, they're more engaged too. you know, uh, parents and kids have a, have their own dance, this emotional dance that they do that they're not doing that dance when their parents are not around. So, uh, love when we get to, they just hang out at our house. Uh, and sometimes they'll spend a night or two. And, uh, so it's, it's the most fun then. Yeah. All right. I think I've asked you this question before, at least when we've had, um, other podcasts about parenting and, and all that. Um, what's one advice, piece of advice you'd give to parents who have teenagers? Since there was a time where you had yeah. probably three teenagers all at the same time. So what would you, what would encouragement or advice or, or something, or maybe even just a warning of what's to come uh, that you would give? Yeah, there's probably a lot of things come to my mind. The, the first thing I would say is when they're really young teenagers, uh, you want to surround them with... Um, People who are heading in the right direction have good, strong character who are a year or two older than them. And because those become the models and everyone needs a model for kind of the next step in their life. And um, so, you know, in some ways, Lindsay, uh, your wife was that person for uh, for my oldest daughter. And, uh, and there were some others that are all Lindsay's friends, uh, that were, were models for them too. So when I look back, I would say we were pretty intentional about the, the people we were trying to get around our kids. And so oftentimes that just meant we invited them to do something or they were babysitting. And, uh, so they became the example. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta stay engaged, right? Because there's just that teenage attitude that is so repulsive at times and you just want to always correct it. But the truth is you just got to stay in conversation, try to be calm and listen. And believe me, I had plenty of times that I was neither calm nor listened, but that's part of how I learned the lesson. Yeah. Because if you stay engaged, uh, there are moments that they emerge as a person and, uh, and re-engage with you. Yeah. All right. I got a whole list of questions here just about like personal preferences. And so when I've tried to do this before with people, I had, you know, had a conversation with Yancey similar. We try to do rapid fire, but I think he, you know, Yancey expounds on everything. So you can do these as rapid fire. I'm surprised. I mean, Yancey can be (laughs) rapid. He is rapid, right? I'm I'm not so rapid. Uh, He's, he, he, he went fast. He probably just didn't, you know, move on to the next question. He just oh, gotcha. would go off and yeah. talk about brisket for a while. So here you go. How, <laughs> how do you take your coffee? I, uh, I take decaf black in the morning. And I hate to say decaf. That's a new thing for me. And in the end, it's probably good because I'm not struggling with caffeine issues. But um, in the afternoons, I typically will add some kind of, you know, uh, Fla- not flavor. I, I usually add oat milk. All right. You know, and I, I don't know why in the afternoon I, I, I like to have that. Yeah. 
So I didn't really realize you were doing decaf. I know you used to be the, the dark roast. You used oh, to be the, man. the Verona. Yeah. Yeah. Miss caffeine, my old friend. Yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, what's your favorite meal? Yeah, this, uh, I love food, so I could give you a long list oh, of yeah. things. And cut my favorite meal, I, I guess it's probably just a good steak. It's probably my favorite meal. Or sushi or seafood or, you know, I mean, yeah. it's a long list, but I, I like good steaks. Is there a, a memorable meal that you've had either at a restaurant or something that you've made or Susan's made? Or Yeah, I mean... Uh, in the last probably six months, I've eaten at two really nice restaurants. Um, one of them was my birthday, and my kids joined us. It was a and b Butcher, and the steaks were, like, just incredible, you know, um, over the top. And then we went to a place called State of Grace. Susan actually uh, won a gift card, and, uh, and so, you know, I didn't know this place. That's why we went there. Is it in Houston? It's in Houston huh. on Westheimer. And uh, we both, you know, we like steak. She's, believe it or not, she's a steak eater. I mean, she's a really a steak eater. And uh, so we got the filet at both of those places. And my goodness. Uh, so both of those, very memorable. Um, but if you're going to go there, paying the check will be memorable too. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So let's talk about fly fishing a little bit. We've already mentioned that you're a little fly bit. fishing. We're just going to talk a uh, little bit. Hey, we can talk as much as you want. Like <laughs> okay. I said, it doesn't have to be rapid fire. And you're already wearing the, the Orvis you uh, know, yeah, this thing over there. Yeah, that wasn't so intentional. What's your favorite place to fly fish? Anywhere where there are big, dumb fish. You know, that's, All right. Uh, but I'll give you some places that I really do love. Yeah, you don't have to fish. give us your honey hole or anything, but just No, I'll us. give you the honey hole. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, really because it, it's... And there's a you know if a place that we stay in Colorado in um, a place called Alma, which is down south of Breckenridge, and in probably about 18 minutes I can get to what I call my home water, because the the home water it's about a mile to walk to it. It's uh, a part of the South Fork of the South Platte River. And the reason I like to go there is because I can fish it by myself. It's pretty skinny water, but it holds really good fish because it's, you know, close to a reservoir uh, just down below. And uh, so that's that's one of my favorite places to go. But um, there's a place on the Colorado River near Kremlin, Colorado called Pump House. So it's just a, it's a state park. And it's big water, though. I don't typically go by myself because, you know, it, it can be dangerous. But, man, I've caught some great fish in, in that river. And it's just a, a beautiful place. It's got a train track that's uh, suspended against this rock face wall, you know. And uh, the train, all you see is, like, the tunnel. And you're fishing along, and then all of a sudden the train comes out of the tunnel. And there are, um, there are mountain goats all around. I say all around, on the pass going down in, into Pump House. There are almost always some mountain goats there. So it's just a lot of wildlife, beautiful area. And, you know, I love trout fishing because you're always standing in beautiful water looking at beautiful sceneries because trout only live in beautiful places. Yeah, yeah. So what got you into fly fishing? Uh, I grew up in the panhandle of Texas, and my parents, we would go vacation in uh, New Mexico. It was about a six-hour drive to a place called Tres Ritos, New Mexico, and they fly fished. And so as a little kid, you know, fly fishing takes a little more technique than most little kids can handle. Um, and so I would fish, but I didn't really fly fish, but they fly fished. And so I, I got to observe it. I didn't really learn how to do it, but I, lo I learned to love the mountains, learn to, you know, navigate a river and understand, you know, what water's like. And, um, so then, you know, got my own family. My kids are growing up. I played a lot of golf, frankly. That was kind of the, the thing I would do when I was uh, recreating. And we, we vacationed to the mountains and such. But, uh, when all my girls graduated from college, actually my last one wasn't quite graduated from college. I, uh, I thought, okay, what? Now's the time that I can kind of add a hobby back into my life because until that time, you know, uh, our children just take so, so much of our energy and attention. And I thought, well, what do I want to do? I, th I thought I want to try fly fishing, and uh, and that's exactly what it was. I was just trying it again, and um, I found that when I get on a river, it's it's pretty comical. My wife laughs at this, Ryan. When I get on a river and I get out of the vehicle 
I'm like a little 10 year old boy all over again, man. My heart's just beating fast. I just can't wait to get my gear on and my rod, you know, all, uh, outfitted and, and get into the water. I, I just love it. So what is it about it that you love so much? Like if you're trying to explain it, like win someone over who's like fishing, this is kind of, kind of boring. Like yeah. what is it about it that just, you know, is your thing? Yeah. A lot of people, they think I'm into fishing and mm -hmm. so they want to talk to me about fishing. I have to explain, I'm not into fishing. I'm into fly fishing. And the difference is that um, with fly fishing, there's – well, you're a fly fisherman, so it's always active. Uh, even the um, most passive forms of fly fishing, it's always active, and it's really complex, right? So the gear is complex. The um, – where fish hold in the river, it's, that's kind of complex. You got to read the water. You got to you got uh, to know how to cast the rod. But even you know people that I'm teaching how to fly fish. Once they hook a fish, it's like okay, now you have a whole different skill set in how do you fight a fish, how do you land a fish uh, without breaking off the line. Because if people don't know, you know the the gear is so fine that it, oftentimes the gear is too fine to like pick up a fish out of the water it just break off. Uh, so it, it takes skill. So all of those things um, <clears throat> keep my mind engaged. It's active. It's, I'm learning all the time. I'm, you know, it's, it's not sitting, thinking, hoping the little bobber goes down sometime, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of fishing. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that kind of fishing. It's just not active. So I, I don't do it. Yeah. And like you said, it's the, the trout only live in beautiful places. So yes. The scenery and just the quiet. It's not quiet because you had the river, but it's like the sound of the river is... It's, it's magical. Un, it's un, yeah, unmatched. It, it's, it, I tell people fishing right sizes my soul. And then it's just the um, the whole experience of nature. And it's, it's the kind of nature that if you're not paying attention then you might get in trouble, you know, uh, because oftentimes you're in the mountains and it's, you got extreme cold at times and, uh, or, you know, gravity gets you <laughs> if you fall down yeah. uh, a hill or something. Yeah. What's your favorite movie? Uh, you know, I, I really like movies. Uh, Susan tolerates movies with me, so we don't go to a lot of movies. But I guess it, and I don't typically rewatch movies, but probably the movie I've rewatched more than any other movie is Braveheart. I, I just find it inspiring. Yeah. You know? So do you like more action movies or do you like comedies or you wouldn't really pin yourself down to one genre or the other? I would say I like. Uh, What's the, how do you say it? They're epic kind of period yeah. pieces. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what would you say is your greatest fear? That's a, that's a deep one for rapid fire. Man, that's, yeah, that's really personal. It's, it's funny. I just talked about some of my fears in the message I recently preached. Um, but, yeah, I mean, greatest fear is probably unrealized potential hmm. or missed opportunities. You know, and we all miss opportunities, but I mean, those opportunities that are, it's like, you know, God served this up on a, on a silver platter for you and you just missed it. And there are a ton of reasons, you know, you could be distracted, you could be uh, afraid uh, to, to take risks or whatever. But I think, uh, yeah, the thing that I sit up at night about sometimes is, uh, is there something that, that we're missing? Is that more of a recent thing as you've gotten older or have you always felt that in some ways? No, actually, I've always felt that way. And the surprise to me is that as I'm getting older, that hasn't gone away. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's still there. Um, I do have a greater sense of who I am, what, and therefore what I think God would have me do. Um, but it's, I still feel that sense of, you know, I want to pay attention, be vigilant, about opportunities that come our way. Mm -hmm. All right, you've gotten to travel some places around the world. If you could go anywhere, whether it's a place that you want to go back to or a place you haven't been to and you want to go to, where would you go? I'm going to give you the truthful answer. Home. <laughs> That's not a fun answer, but um, I, I love being home. 
But there are places I want to go. Like, and most of them are great places to fish. All right. So, uh, Montana, I haven't fished Montana. And those who are listening who, who have, it's like, well, then you haven't fished, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I would love to go to Jackson Hole, um, or go north of there into Montana and, and fish those waters. Uh, and Patagonia, I've been to Patagonia once and fished there, but I, we didn't hit it, you know, we, we hit a bad weather season, um, and so I only had one good day of fishing. So I would I would love to do that again. But really, Montana more so because I have been to, to Patagonia. Yeah. What about Susan? What would she say? She fortunately we're a lot alike in this way. She's uh, she's not one to really want to travel uh, a lot. And so I don't I don't know that I mean she doesn't have something on her bucket list that she's telling me about. Um, we went to Washington D.C. You know this places in the states, uh, and recently went to to Boston. I mean within the last year, and those are just places we'd never been that that she wanted to go to. I think she would love to to just go up and down the Eastern Seaboard, um, which again never we've never done. Yeah, cool. All right, what are some of the books that have most shaped your relationship with God over the years? Yeah, uh, I'd say outside the Bible, um, which has shaped my life the most, obviously. Uh, there's a, a little-known book called Disciples Are Made, Not Born. Literally, when I became a Christian, the person who began discipling me gave me this book. And it's really about how disciple-making is the responsibility of all believers. And it's not just for the, you know, the church staff people uh, or the, you know, the most mature uh, people in their faith. And I think when I, when I think about the books that have shaped my walk with God, Disciples Are, are Made Not Born is definitely one of those books. Is it still in print, do you know? Yeah, it yes. is. Uh, Walter Hendrickson is uh, the author. Hmm. Prodigal God. Um, some may know that in 2009, we had kind of a renewal of, of gospel centrality and not like we didn't know the gospel or weren't preaching the gospel or anything like that, but it was more about seeing all of what we do in the life of the church through the lens of the gospel. And one of the things that probably influenced me the most was Prodigal God, which is a book by Tim Keller. And it's a, it's a, book that's focused on the story of the prodigal son, and it shows that both the younger brother and the older brother were, you know, distant from the father. In other words, sometimes uh, it is the rebellious heart that is is demonstrating their sin against God, but sometimes it's the self-righteous heart. And the reason it's so significant for me is because I tend to be uh, more the older brother than the younger brother. You know, I've never been the person who is really overtly rebellious, but I have struggled plenty uh, as the person who's somewhat self-righteous in thinking that I kind of, I got my act together, you know, when in fact, uh, I desperately need Jesus, just like anybody else who, you know, is on the other side of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, since books are written by authors and, you know, people, and a lot of times they're sharing their own stories. I mean, who are some of the, the people, the authors that stand out to you beyond uh, Tim Keller? Um, well, I, I don't know C.S. Lewis, but, <laughs> you know, uh, C.S. Lewis definitely, it, just the way his, his mind works, um, the clarity with which he writes is... Uh, inspiring and compelling. So, Mere Christianity is a book that um, has really shaped shaped my life. But partly because it feels like it, uh, Christianity. He helps Christianity uh, just make sense. I mean, just really from a, a, an uber rational point of view, uh, Christianity makes makes sense. And uh, I, I don't think that the authority of Christianity has to be tied to the fact that everything has to make sense. But it's beautiful when somebody can can help you understand how it all makes sense, you know. So um, definitely um, C.S. Lewis. And, and, you know, a lot of the people that are most influential in my life, uh, they didn't write any books, you know, or I didn't read their book. But uh, there's a guy that his name is Jim Ryan. 
And when I came out of college and went to work at the very first church out of college, I hadn't even done seminary yet. I was starting seminary. Uh, I went to work as an associate pastor, which meant I was to be the student director and oversee all of the, uh, this is when we were, I was in a, a church in a Sunday school, all the Sunday school teachers, I was uh, overseeing them. And, um, and it was a r- small church, you know, 160 people or whatever. And Jim, who is about five years older than me, really poured into me. And he, he taught me to love people. You know, he, he just really loves people well. Still to this day, he's a dear friend. He's a pastor in California now and has been for, you know, 30 plus years. But um, he demonstrated a kind of love that I had not seen before. And he believed in me, loved me well uh, also. And so I'm always grateful for that. You know, Mark Carton uh, is one of those people because Mark, I'd never seen someone that um, – wasn't a part of, you know, leading churches be as engaged in the ministry of a local church as Mark. I mean, just his devotion as, uh, at that time, an accountant. And, uh, and so that's marked me as well as, uh, no pun intended there, uh, as well as just, you know, doing life together, raising our kids together. So he's the kind of friend that um, his, his character has, has been a gift. Yeah. And you've both been on staff for a really long time, just doing this side by side. And yeah, yeah, it's really awesome. I mean, speaking of, I mean, I've heard over the years, there's been, you know, I've heard people say the average pastor stays out of church for three years or four years, five. I've heard all kinds of different numbers in there. But the point is they don't stick around for very long. Um, You stayed at Clear Creek for 28 years, right? A little, a little more than 28 years, right. two, 28 and a half, I think, or so. Uh, why have you stayed so long? I, uh, I think there are a couple of reasons, really. Uh, one is I, th- I think just my gifting is I'm a developer. I'm not necessarily a, a starter. I mean, I, I do start things. You know, we've, I can give you a list of things that I've, I've started, but... Um, but I think the, the real passion in my life is developing. And so the development of the church, the, the people, the ministry through the years is kind of what I have a heart for. And uh, so I, I really don't, I don't think about leaving. I think about developing, you know. And um, another reason is Clear Creek has, we've had a history where we've seen uh, growth, but it's been kind of st- steady along the way. And so it, in any five-year season, it doesn't feel like I'm necessarily doing the exact same thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's not like I got bored doing what I'm doing because I'm doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, sure, we're studying and we're preaching, and uh, but there's always something fresh going on. Mm, absolutely. So what have you learned from being in the same place for so long? I, mean, I imagine that's pretty impactful to be around for 28 years and to see so many things change. Yeah. Yeah, what's really fun to see change is um, I, I see young adults today who are raising their kids at Clear Creek who were kids at Clear Creek. And mm-hmm. so I, that's really, really fun to see. Uh, when I think about your wife, Lindsay, you know, I knew her as a teenager. And now to see her as... Uh, we got one going to student ministry starting this summer. Yeah. We'll be going into sixth grade. So, so uh, we'll have a teenager so pretty fun. soon. But the probably the most rewarding thing, not probably, no no doubt, the, the most rewarding thing is just to see change lives, you know. And it's, I you know, as a young man, I thought it would be um, seeing, you know, the, the buildings we build, the, the missions we we go on, the churches that we start, and all of that is, those are markers, but the most rewarding thing is just change lives. You know, when I look around on any given Sunday or Wednesday and people are worshiping, and I know some of the stories of, you know, the people in the room who are worshiping, and I just think, you know, God's a, God's a powerful God. The gospel is life-changing, and uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. So what's your hope for Clear Creek over the next five years? My hope for Clear Creek 
You know, we probably don't have time for me to unpack all of that, but I'll give you the, the brief answer for that. Uh, I, I really hope that we see a, a real revival of our missional intensity. Uh, I'll explain myself there. You know, the, the last two years has been, uh, it's just been a beating um, with the whole pandemic and the kind of resorting that's going on in churches and um and f- for, I mean, a long, long time, we enjoyed the the gift of missional intensity as a church, where so many people are engaged with their friends who are far from God and are not interested in God and uh, engaging them in the life of the church and being a, a witness for Jesus to them. And, you know, that's still going on. I mean, I know it's still going on. Just the overall intensity is not... Uh, what we have experienced in the past. And I'm not just thinking of the past, okay? I mean, I think it's going to look different. I think the church is going to be different when we have that kind of missional intensity. Um, but I I hope to see that when I'm, I'm still around here. Um, you know, I, I think another way to think about it is to think about our values and t- to see the church really inculcate our values so that uh, each of our values. So gospel centrality, I think we're, we're really seeing that now. Uh, biblical community, there is a sense in which we need to recover that because the pandemic, again, it just beat us up in the sense of people really being connected in community. So to see that happen, to see missional living, uh, a lot of that has to do with this missional intensity that I'm talking about, and people engaged in serving in the community and engaged with their friends. And then when we talk about relentless stewardship, the idea that, you know, we know that what we have has been given by God. We we use all the resources that we have for the kingdom, and we we steward those resources uh, relentlessly so that we're using money in a way that honors God and and really wins the um, the trust of people that we're going to use money well. So I think that's an, an important thing. But uh, you know we've we've really added a value and. That's this whole idea of kingdom multiplication. And of all the values, I think uh, if in the next five years what we could see, because, you know, we're at a different place in our church life. Uh, As a church that's now 28 plus years old, years old, and we have a a different kind of influence both in our community and in greater Houston. Uh, The idea of seeing multiplication really happen at every level in the life of the church is, man, it. That makes my heart beat fast. So what I'm talking about is we're multiplying disciples, we're multiplying leaders, we're multiplying churches, we're multiplying, I'll dare say, movements. Probably it'd be fair to say networks. You know, movements are really something only God can do. But to be a part of multiplying networks of churches that are planting churches, um, not just in Houston, but in cities around the world, uh, to see multiplication in all those areas, e- even to get some traction in all those areas would be, um, would be the fulfillment of a great aspiration. Absolutely. Well, and I, you know, I think I've seen, I've seen you lead that really well over the years. And I think as a, as a church, we get to be a part of God doing some pretty amazing things throughout uh, the Houston area and throughout the, the country and around the world and with the Houston Church Planning Network and Acts 29 and um, us being able to send you in a lot of ways to go with you as, you know, we're seeing just, um, you know, an incredible work all around us. And um, those are stories that we have celebrated, we'll continue to celebrate and, um, you know, in God's grace and mercy to us, we'll continue to see that in mm-hmm. many years to come. Well, I'm with you. I, I really hope so. And it does feel like all, all of this just feels like this incredible grace that's just not just washed over us. It just continues to wash over us out of the kindness of God. And so I'm a grateful person. All right. Well, we're grateful for you, your leadership, your care, uh, your love for us and for people around you. And um, looking forward to however many years we get ahead to continue to, to be a part of God's mission. Well, thank you, Ryan. I, you, you made this... Uh, easy so I didn't sweat so much. All right. Thanks. (laughs) Hey, thanks for checking out this video. If you haven't yet, make sure that you hit subscribe down below and check out clearcreekresources.org. We have videos, books, and sermons on there, as well as our audio podcast. Thanks for watching.